A lot of people have talked about blasters over the years. Some have explained the origin of props used in movies. Others talk about the real-life physics, how blasters would work in reality. A few are interested in Star Destroyer vs Deep Space Nine. I went looking for a video on the subject of blasters, and I was disappointed. Nobody has covered this in the way I want to see. The most interesting thing about blasters, in my eyes, is how they change over time. When the canon was rewritten, what was changed? The question is a little hard to research if you didn't see it change. I believe that's exactly what we should document the most. There are still some good videos on the subject. Martin Archer discusses the physics. Plasma is a state of matter, a bit like a gas. He concludes that blasters cannot be laser weapons, but plasma is possible. Johnny Johnson discusses the limitations of lasers as weaponry. Another issue lasers have is their energy takes time to cut or damage a target. Forgotten Weapons explains all the obscure real-world designs behind the movie props. Uh, here you can see the bottom, that's very clearly a Sterling submachine gun with the stock folded. They used uh, 10 round magazines in these. As well he should. I consider that quite definitive. The Royal Armouries and GameSpot present some props. We can see a side by side of everything that was done to turn this into the Empire's sort of main infantry weapon of choice. This includes a genuine E11 blaster, quite amazing. Fandom Power Podcast talks about both the props and the in universe usage. As far as pistols from Blast Tech go, the DT 12 doesn't even come close to the popularity of the DL 44. Arch also tackles the blaster question in real-world terms. But to explosively blast a half-metre hole in a wall, you would need many, many, many times that. A little out of his element, he talks about two blasters. One is an old blaster which he treats as a laser weapon. But before then, let's just have a general look at the E-11 blaster rifle, or blaster carbine, technically speaking. The other is a new blaster, treated as a plasma weapon. We will of course be starting with the DC-15, when I'm going to be just ragging on about how the shit would not bloody function. An interesting video, but it misses a detail. Why one was a laser and one was plasma. He is an expert on Warhammer 40k, which has both laser and plasma rifles. Neither one behaves like a blaster. Geetzlees tells the history of the blaster. The first blaster weapons were designed by the Ricarda for use by their war droids. He mentions early developments like the beam tube and pulse wave blaster. Several people discuss the impact on a target. However, it doesn't state precisely what a blaster bolt is made of. In what I find is quite a surprise, a channel named Gemstones has one of the best videos on blasters. Han shot first, by the way. This is barely even related to the channel. She's here for the crystals. If I'm talking about a movie, you can be darn sure there are some pretty rocks in it. Despite mixing eras, she outlines the main options. Laser, particle beam, plasma. With the focus on crystals, she spots a flaw immediately. Can they focus concentrated beams of plasma? Nope. No, they can't. You can't pass plasma through a solid prismatic crystal. The reason for all of this confusion is that there can be no good answer. The law is contradictory. It cannot all be true. To believe any one detail, you must discard two others. Solving this conundrum is a personal decision. I'm not here to read the wiki aloud for you. I can't tell you what to believe about blasters. I'm here to advise you in making the choice for yourself. The wiki resolves contradictions using the Bacon Index. This measures how closely related Kevin Bacon is to any given actor. In the wiki's case, it tries to measure Lucasness. If you can increase your Lucasness ranking, you can overwrite old law. However you determine Lucasness will dictate your conclusions. Other people will go by publication date. Anytime there is a contradiction, the older material automatically loses. A mistake made tomorrow can overwrite decades of history. I take the opposite approach. Whenever there is a contradiction, the older book wins. A system of precedent where long-established law remains. If we have known about X for decades, that fact stays. When a book tells you the sky is green, that book is wrong. No question about what canon tier the book is. You can call the book S, C, T or G class, but the sky is still blue. What exactly is a blaster? It's a ray gun, dummy. 
Well, yes, I suppose it is. But not all ray guns are alike. As originally intended, blasters and phasers were supposed to be laser weapons. Cleverly, both Star Trek and Star Wars avoid the word laser. The creators foresaw this exact video. They knew that in the far-flung future of 2020-23, some guy would complain if they did. While lasers were a fantastic bit of cutting-edge science at the time, it wouldn't stay that way. My local library has several lasers. I couldn't tell you exactly how many, but I'm confident there are half a dozen. A supermarket probably has over 50 lasers. This is no longer an exotic technology of the future. Light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation does not work that way. In both sci-fi universes, the ray gun has been renamed away from the word laser. Star Trek handles it a little better, in that they contrast phasers with lasers. In that world, lasers are old-fashioned. If you want a primitive species to fire harmlessly, give them lasers. What is a laser? Sweet. Think of it as a physics exploit. Imagine you have a little rubber super bouncy ball. You also have a metal pipe. You drop the rubber ball down the pipe and close both ends of the pipe. Now you have a ball bouncing inside there forever. It becomes a laser once you add magic. Pump a magical gas into the tube. When a bouncy ball flies through this gas, it duplicates the ball. Before long, one of the end caps bursts off and a stream of balls flies out the end. That's how I'd explain it to Captain Kirk anyway. Okay, it's like a rubber ball, Captain. Haggis. Hi. Don't you ever relax? I am relaxed. Star Wars takes a different tack. Technically, it uses laser more often than blaster, but only technically. The underlying ray gun technology is named blaster. Everything that uses these same operating principles is a type of blaster. When the blasters start getting large, that's when lasers come in. Any kind of man-portable blaster is called a blaster. When you scale up to vehicle weapons, we call those laser cannons. For extremely large ones, we use the term turbo laser. This roughly lines up with the caliber of earth weapons, the inner barrel diameter. Blasters are small arms, lasers are autocannons, and turbo lasers are artillery guns. All of that knowledge is apparent from watching the movies. You don't need to read any supplemental material for it, not even the original novelizations. More books have been published, and now we know the operating principles of a blaster. It is described as a laser slash particle beam. Lando has become a respectable businessman and is now in charge of an oil rig. Okay, it isn't drilling for oil, but that's still the most accurate description. Cloud City is a gas mining facility. It pulls up gases from much deeper in the atmosphere of the gas giant. Lando has a premium product here. He produces a higher grade of gas than normal. The gas is exported in blocks of carbonite for use in various machinery. When I say gas, I don't mean gasoline. This is not petrol. The particular gas is named Tibana. Blasters are one of the main uses of this Tibana gas. There do exist alternative gases, and it's possible some might even be superior. For the most part, you can walk into any shop where blasters are sold and ask to buy a refill bottle of Tabana. Some blasters use gas canisters that can be replaced in the field. Others have a filling port and a fixed internal reservoir. Both options are entirely reasonable choices. The gas is rarely a limiting factor. It would be like worrying that your Kalashnikov assault rifle will run out of lubricant. That could happen, and you could carry an oil can in your pocket yep. to make sure. You probably aren't going to run out in combat. The game Mass Effect 1 has something similar. In the lore of that universe, the weapons shave tiny pellets off a block of metal. Those shards are flung down the barrel at high speed. The only time you ever hear of anyone's rifle running dry, it's after days of combat. For two days, I chased her through that station, used my entire store of ammunition, I had to kill a bunch of mercs and use their crap weapons. That's remarkable, and in the game, everything has infinite ammunition. That isn't the case for Star Wars, because blasters take two ammunition types, the gas and a power source. Most hand weapons use detachable power packs, which happen to look like magazines. For a vehicle, its cannons are tied into the vessel's electrical system. With every shot, the blaster consumes a tiny amount of blaster gas. 
In a perfectly believable lore detail, we get the name of one of the components. First, the gas is moved into the gas conversion enabler. This is the Exciter, with a capital XC. This surprises me not a jot. This is where the power comes in, exciting the gas. So far, so good. All of this is physically possible in our galaxy with current technology. A wiser knight in the ways of science could even suggest a blaster gas. This next bit is where we enter the realm of sci-fi. The next component is the actuating blaster module. This processes the gas into a beam composed of intense energy particles coupled with light. First of all, I'm not sure that means anything, or is physically possible. Second, the book actually says comprised of, but it's incorrect. The beam is composed of the lightened particles. The lightened particles comprise the beam. If we were to ignore the coupled with part, that might make sense. This gas processing creates light during some steps, and that's all it means. Continuing on, we have a prismatic crystal housing to focus the beam. Then it is galvaned. This doesn't involve zinc, it's part of the sci-fi rules, one of the few technologies Earth can never have, otherwise we could make our own lightsabers. To galvan is to continue focusing the beam as it travels down the barrel. That's not the end of it. We might have reached the front end of the blaster, but there's still more. Now that we understand what's going on inside the blaster, let's see what a bolt is. What, precisely, is a blaster bolt made of? And now it is time for the important bit. Pay attention here, because this little detail is one of the telltale signs of deep knowledge. If you whip this out at parties, everyone will be impressed. The particle beam is released as a bolt. This clearly travels slower than the speed of light. Blaster bolts are slower than a speeding bullet, and also the ordinary kind. At least, the visible part is slow. However, the visible light of a blaster bolt is completely harmless. For more decades than many of our audience have been alive, we have known this. The damage is dealt by the invisible portion of the blaster beam. A lot of people have missed this nuance. It's one of those things that a fan appreciates in every scene they'd used. To a casual observer, it's natural to assume the glowy thing does the damage. In fact, I'm fairly confident most people working on Star Wars never knew this, that George Lucas probably doesn't know about this. That's okay though, because it should be consistent with what is shown on screen. In the cross-sections book for Attack of the Clones, a new detail is added. It says blasters fire invisible energy beams that travel at the speed of light. This might have been implied before, but it was never stated that I can find. This bit of text mentions a detail that I believe is ancient. The blaster bolts we see travel along the invisible beam, slower. That means the invisible, damaging part can hit before the bolt does. This is a neat detail. I love it. However, I will admit it smells suspicious. This sounds like someone trying to explain a failure of special effects. I don't know of anywhere in the original movie that makes this mistake. In Empire Strikes Back, there was such a problem. A Star Destroyer is in the middle of bombarding some asteroids. One frame before a turbo laser bolt connects, an asteroid explodes. This is the sort of detail that I'm willing to overlook. Someone slipped up during the special effects work. Or maybe this was one frame off on purpose, as a joke. Maybe another bolt hit it earlier, and it's only just exploding now. We'll have to keep this in mind while going through the mechanisms. Just remember that this is a very old detail to explain an old problem. This same block of text also gives a perfect solution to an old oddity. The largest type of blaster, well, the largest is the Death Star Super Laser, the second and third largest type of blaster are the turbo lasers. Remember the Hoth planetary ion cannon? The second largest blaster are the planetary turbo laser. When Princess Leia said Alderaan had no weapons, she meant these. With enough cannons like this, I believe you could fight back against the Death Star. The third largest are capital ship turbo lasers. Turbo just means super extra hyper ultra big. The turbocharger is a good way to boost the performance of a piston engine. <laughs> For that matter, turbine engines tend to be more efficient than piston engines. Really, turbo does not mean good, it refers to spinning. I'll try spinning, that's a good trick. 
Sometimes spinning really is a good trick. Yippee! The original explanation for the name was a valiant effort. Turbo lasers draw so much power they require a dedicated turbine, or if you like to tunak tunak tune, a turban. <laughs> ah, the wonders of scarf origami. Having a turbine for your turbo laser does make sense. It's a reasonable component to have next to the giant cannon. However, I like the cross sections explanation better. In that book, turbo lasers spin the energy beam to get longer range. This really justifies the name. That implies none of the smaller blasters do any spinning, which I also like. I'm not sure you can spin light, you'd probably end up polarizing it instead. For any kind of plasma or particle beam, spinning is perfectly valid. What kind of Pokemon are you? Let's start with the most straightforward option. Let's suppose a blaster is just a laser. Nothing more, nothing less. It's a laser pistol. The only thing setting a blaster apart from earth lasers is some tech. Blasters can store energy more efficiently than earth lasers. Blasters can charge up a bolt to higher intensities than earth lasers. This approach has some advantages. The destructive power makes sense. The timeline makes sense. Lasers were still quite new in the 70s. I think this was always the intention, that blasters and lightsabers were just lasers. The descriptions are even similar. The blaster describes gas excited by electrical energy. Earth has lasers that work in exactly this fashion, running a current through gases like helium and neon. Then, the blaster gas is moved into a new chamber, where it produces intense energy and light. That sounds a lot like a laser to me. The blaster then mentions a prismatic crystal that changes the focus of the beam. Lasers can use crystals like ruby, which is where the idea of lightsaber crystals comes from. Everything about this whole process screams laser. That crystal is particularly interesting. If we put this crystal in the path of the beam, that could work to focus it. To do that, the beam needs to pass through the crystal without damaging it. That would mean there can be no tangible projectile coming out of a blaster. A blaster bolt is just a beam of light like a laser. There is room to interpret prismatic crystal housing as having a hollow center. Perhaps it can focus the beam from the sides, instead of passing through like a lens or prism. The problem with the laser explanation is how the blaster bolts look on screen. The bolts take several frames to fly across the camera's field of view. That means the laser idea is inconsistent with the movie. How big a problem that is, that's a personal judgement. Some assume that anything on screen is canon. If there is a wardrobe malfunction in the movie, that affects canon. You can see this in action with the question of Stormtrooper helmets. Some say that if you can see the actor's skin, the costume isn't sealed airtight. So, when Harrison Ford accidentally knocks an actor's helmet, it changes canon. To these people, it doesn't matter that the law disagrees. A mistake that's in the movie would overwrite every bit of contradicting information. I definitely do not take this stance. A movie is a movie, and it has limitations. He told me you killed him. No. I am your father. If a boom microphone appeared by mistake, I would not explain that in-universe. I would say this is a flaw in the movie, and clearly wasn't intended. The reason I bring this up is to do with the speed of blaster bolts. The movie clearly depicts blaster bolts as flying slowly. If the movie trumps all other material, that means blasters cannot be lasers. A laser beam would travel at the speed of light, we wouldn't see it as a bolt. I still think laser blasters would be fine. The special effects are done at a speed the audience can make sense of. The blaster bolt is as slow as it needs to be for the movie to be understood. Another question is recoil. Kinetic weapons normally have recoil, because the projectile is launched with great momentum. We would not expect a laser to have any recoil, no matter how intense the laser beam. In the very first movie, there are some iconic shots of a turbo laser cannon recoiling. In the prequels, we have the good captain demonstrating his best mad minute. This clearly shows a blaster with recoil, and it isn't an accident. I reckon that wrist movement is intentional, something the actor was told to do. Recoil counts as a point against the idea of laser blasters. What kind of Pokemon are you? Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Now let's take a look at an alternative, the Electro Laser. This one still uses laser technology, of course. The operating principle, however, is more like a bolt of lightning. 
You know what lightning looks like. It's a big jagged electrical arc. The current takes a twisty route to the ground. The same principle applies on a smaller scale, with lower voltages and distances. The electrolaser is a refinement of that. Like with the previous option, pulling the trigger on a blaster fires a laser. That laser creates a conductive path in a straight line toward your target. Then the second phase of the firing cycle kicks in. An electric current is sent along the laser-guided path. This looks completely different from lightning, because it doesn't form any kind of arc. The zap travels in the same straight line as the laser did. It's strange to see an electrical arc that has no arch to it. In fact, the electrolaser looks a lot like some sci-fi laser weapons. In Warhammer 40k, the LAS cannon and Bright Lance could plausibly be electrolaser weapons. If you're making a weapon, the laser itself can also deal damage. Then the lightning adds elemental damage on top of that. Could have been, but then not. Honestly, I can't name a single sci-fi universe that uses electrolaser weaponry. We can confidently say this isn't what blasters were intended to be. It does have the positive feature of firing an invisible beam, followed by a pulse along it. That lines up with some of our lore about blasters, such as the visible light being harmless. However, this would make the invisible portion harmless as well. Only the bolt of directed lightning would cause damage. An electrolaser lines up with the visuals, but not much else. In fact, we can prove that blasters are not electrolasers. The operating principle of an electrolaser requires an atmosphere. The electric current jumps between molecules, the laser makes them conductive. If this was how blasters worked, they would be useless in deep space. Given that we can see laser cannons and turbo lasers used in space, that settles the matter. The electrolaser turns the atmosphere into a plasma trail, blasters do not. Which brings us to the next explanation. What kind of Pokemon are you? One fairly common idea uses the word plasma. This word is not used in connection with blasters. Okay, it is these days, but that was never a traditional part of how blasters work. Some of you may be astonished to hear this. For a long time, fans have thought that blasters launch bolts of plasma. This is not the normal state of affairs, it is a new change. Plasma is sometimes described as an additional state of matter beyond the usual three. Plasma is a gas that can be manipulated with electromagnetism. That makes it easy to understand how this confusion came about. We have always known that blasters use gas as ammunition plus electric charge. We know the gas is processed using the electricity. It would be reasonable to assume that gas is launched out the end. This is a good explanation. It automatically explains several things about blasters. I don't think I need to convince anyone. This is more likely than an electrolaser. However, I want to emphasize that blasters and plasma were never linked. Blasters worked fine for decades before plasma was ever introduced. Then, all of a sudden, they were re-explained to all be plasma throwers. In the original expanded universe, plasma did exist. Plasma was associated with sublight drive exhaust. You could buy plasma cutting torches and plasma welders. If a facility was damaged, you might find plasma fires raging at the lower levels. A very exotic alien species might have a plasma cannon, named that because it isn't the same thing as a blaster. The turning point seems to be the time of the prequels. In November 1997, the Essential Guide to Weapons and Technology was published. In 1998, Star Wars The Visual Dictionary was published. The Essential Guide makes no mention of plasma for its blasters. It only mentions plasma when talking about hand tools or a plasma beam drill. In contrast, the visual dictionary says blaster gas is converted to plasma, then launched. This idea is repeated throughout the visual dictionary series. Blaster pistols firing plasma is mentioned once in the episode 1 VD. The episode 2 VD says all standard blasters fire plasma bolts. Amusingly, it also tries to fix a joke from the standard list. Hey guys, have you ever noticed stormtroopers are inaccurate? This isn't much of a problem in-universe, it's more of a conversation piece between fans. The VD says all blasters are notoriously hard to aim, because plasma is unstable. Oddly enough, the episode 3 VD doesn't mention plasma at all. If we go with the plasma interpretation, a lot of things make sense. For one thing, blaster barrels appear to have a hole in the end. Supposing blasters were meant to be laser weapons, we would expect a lens at the end of the barrel. Blasters look like they're projectile weapons, not energy weapons. If there's a hole at the end of the barrel, you'd expect something to be launched through it. That is certainly a point in favour of plasma. 
Can they focus concentrated beams of plasma? Nope. No, they can't. You can't pass plasma through a solid prismatic crystal. The speed of blaster bolts now makes perfect sense. The plasma is propelled electromagnetically down the barrel, so it can be any speed. A longer barrel would naturally produce a faster bolt of plasma. As far as I can tell, plasma blasters are perfectly consistent with everything in the movies. There's no reason we shouldn't believe this, except that it's a change from the original. If you consider the most recent thing to always be correct, blasters are plasma. That doesn't work for me. I liked Star Wars before any of these newfangled books were published. Some people split the difference, saying that clone blasters are the only plasma throwers. All the other blasters would remain laser-based. This is due to clone DC-15 blasters being the most common of the plasma weapons. There seems to be no basis for this in the lore. The clone blasters are said to be normal. The same place they're described as plasma, it says all standard blasters are plasma. I don't see any room for these explanations to coexist. Either they're all plasma or all laser blasters. There is another option. We can retain some of the positive features of plasma while keeping it old school. I say blasters were meant to be lasers. If you were to ask an audience walking out of any movie, they would say laser, at least for all three of the original trilogy. The pole would be 100% laser, nobody would say plasma or electro laser. Problem is, lasers do not work that way. I have the solution. Remember, the 1997 book calls them laser slash particle beam weapons. If you focus on the particle beam, that is quite distinct from all the previous options. For one thing, a particle beam would need an emitter. I reckon the easiest way to do that would be a hollow tube sticking out the front of a blaster. That gets us our barrel with a hole in it, instead of a laser lens. Most importantly, particle is rather a vague term. From a certain point of view, light is a beam of photon particles. Light travels at the speed of light, surprisingly enough. That unseen light could be a laser outside the visible spectrum and do the damage. So in a sense, the blaster remains a laser pistol. The particle beam aspect, well, that's a little different from the laser. Particles are generally going to be heavier and slower than light. That accounts for the visible component of the blaster bolt. Perhaps the bolt we see really is the Tabana gas being launched as plasma. Or it could be that the weapon is all particle beam. Both the visible and invisible parts are particle beams, slower than light. In Earth physics, an alpha particle is the nucleus of a helium atom. Whatever Tabana gas is on a molecular level, I bet it's quite heavy. That would imply a blaster gas particle travels relatively slowly. This particle beam is established in the old law, as far back as I can see. If blasters are more than a laser weapon, then our earliest precedent is for particle beams. In what I believe to be a coincidence, this is also what Star Trek has settled on. Both sci-fi settings used weapons that were intended as lasers. Star Trek uses a beam of nadion particles, called a phaser. Being a visual medium, the special effects are similar for both universes. We see beams with a travel time. Star Trek always makes for an instructive comparison. As an aside, Trek may also use a phased array for its phaser emitters. The problem is this, actors aren't good at aiming. When the special effects are added, a line is drawn from the hand phaser to the target. Quite often, this is misaligned. The phaser was pointing somewhere else. That only makes the Federation look more advanced. Clearly, the phaser can compensate and aim off to the side. The mistake actually made the universe more interesting. The neat thing about a phased array is that it appears to be a flat plane. In reality, it is a grid of individual emitters. By adjusting the delay across the grid, a phased array can aim without physically rotating. That is a fantastic concept, and it doesn't often appear in science fiction. The one that comes to mind is the phased disassembler array. It comes from a game called Homeworld, and has a variety of uses. The PDA is used on resource collectors to tear apart asteroids with its fusion torches. Another use is on the repair corvette and support frigate, the good old magic beam. This is a green effect and involves disassembling the damaged parts of the ship. Then it is reassembled according to specifications in the repair ship's memory banks. Like any good sci-fi universe, this same technology is used in multiple ways. Phased disassembler arrays make the entire game possible by speeding up ship construction. This way you can build a new destroyer in 150 seconds 
and again every 150 seconds, independently of cranking out a new fighter every 12 seconds, a repair corvette every 20 seconds, and an ion cannon frigate every minute. Anyway, back to Star Wars. The particle beam lines up in a variety of ways. Along with plasma, it has the closest projectile speed to what we see on screen. It explains the shape of the props, why there's no laser lens. Where it differs from plasma is that the particle beam is consistent with the original blaster design and lore. I think that's worth something. Using a double particle beam means sacrificing another bit of lore, the idea that blaster bolts travel at light speed. Now that made sense for a laser blaster, but it is incompatible with either plasma or particle beams. A particle beam won't travel at the speed of light. They may get quite close to it, which accounts for long-range space combat. There is another issue when blasters interact with deflector shields. Shields come in two variants. The only one referred to on screen represents half the dichotomy. The Death Star Trench Run uses proton torpedoes in order to bypass shields. It is implied that X-Wing laser cannons could have destroyed the Death Star. However, the weak point was ray shielded. This sounds fine until you find out about the other kind of shielding. Ray shields block energy weapons, particle shields block physical objects. I trust you can see the problem. The specification for ray shields was to block laser weapons. Changing the mechanism for blasters undermines the shielding technology. If a blaster is a particle beam weapon, it should pass right through a ray shield. For plasma blasters, it's even worse. A plasma bolt is a physical projectile similar to a bullet. Particle shields would block particle beams and plasma. That is the one thing that should never happen. Those are defined as not affecting blasters. Yet, the new blasters would logically work the opposite way against the shield types. If we accept either the plasma or particle beam blaster, shields make no sense at all. We would need to throw out everything we know about shields to make those work. The only way to avoid this issue is to leave blasters unchanged. They started out as laser weapons, so let them stay as laser weapons. An alternative would be to say the shield names are wrong. Even for a laser, we have terminology to describe that as a ray or a particle beam. It could be that a ray shield is whatever would block blaster weapons. As blasters have been retroactively changed from laser to plasma, so have shields. Shielding is a subject that deserves a video all of its own. There is a lot to cover. In order to understand blasters better, let's take a look at their history. It's time to go back to 20,000 years before a long time ago. If you smoke and eat bacon fast enough, you can go back in time. Back Ooh, in time. Sayonara, present day. <laughs> In this era of the galaxy, conventional Earth weapons were used, projectile guns and magnetic accelerators. That is, until the development of the beam tube, crude prototypes, ancestors to the primitive weapons that blasters evolved from. They are limited in a dozen ways. Like an emplaced blaster, they require a backpack power source. This weighs 30 kilograms and holds only 100 shots. Both the backpack and beam tube are very bulky. It requires two hands to operate the business end. The cooling systems blast hot air into the soldier's face. Optimum range is 20 meters, maximum is 50 meters. That's worse than some pistols. They also require several seconds in order to gather the power to fire. Beyond that, beam tubes are brittle and easily damaged. The internal refinement tubes can be thrown out of alignment. If that happens, it will take four hours to repair and reconfigure. Why would anyone bother with such a device? Mostly because until then, armor was bulletproof. Protection against high-velocity projectiles is one thing. Energy beams are something else entirely. Notice that the power cord connects the handheld part to the backpack. Not bad as a beamy def gun. The beam tube is the precursor to something called blast rifles. Importantly, the beam tube is an energy hyphen particle weapon. The ancient protoblaster is a particle beam device. Next, it's time to take a look at the blast rifle. These have a similar shape to modern blaster rifles, just with a longer barrel. More of a collector's item than a weapon in this day and age. What's interesting to note here is that blast rifles are not beam tubes. The blast rifle shoots beams of concentrated light, explicitly said to be lasers. Not in the same way as turbo lasers, these are real Earth-style lasers. That is a very different beast from a particle beam. Blast rifles are so obsolete, there are no modern batteries to fit them. You need to handcraft an adapter mechanism for a modern power pack. The final progenitor device is the pulse wave blaster. These fire a packet of coherent energy. 
That is laser terminology for sure. They are described as functioning similar to disruptors. Pulse wave blasters are clearly more like lasers than anything else, and not too far off normal blasters. This history is confusing. The beam tube is a particle beam weapon. The blast rifle is a laser weapon. The pulse wave blaster is something a lot like a laser. Finally, blasters are somehow different from all of these. Putting all of this together, the result is confusion. This is a question you have to answer on your own. Laser blasters are a fully valid option. Lasers are the correct answer, originally. Lasers travel at the speed of light. Electro lasers are fun. I can understand wanting more of them in sci-fi. Plasma blasters are the official answer, until it changes again. They line up best with the special effects. They just aren't the original lore, that's all. Particle beam blasters are my preferred option. Their history is almost as traditional as the laser blaster. Particle beams can be made to work with almost any lore, new or old. Which answer you pick matters not. The important part is the reasoning that leads you to it. Last LOL Tractor uses a TF2 avatar, Conk, a Discord moderator, the last survivor of the 423rd Royal Battlemech Division, who tried out 422 times before they accepted him, and Zafrex, whose name sounds like a pill you would take to calm down while scrolling your Twitter timeline. Nice guy, honestly. What, you think you're some kind of Jedi waving your hand around like that? I'm a Toydarian! My trick's gonna work on me! Only money! No money, no parts, no deal! <laughs> 